Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. I am Jennifer Cunningham. I am Lehigh's AVP for Alumni Relations, and I'm thrilled to be offering this mountain talk to you today. We have um, just, this is a popular one, we have over 400 people signed up. Um, about 110 of you are on right now, and I'm sure the rest will get the recording, which we are doing. So if you do have to drop off or you find this really um, fascinating and want to share it with a friend, you'll get a link to the recording um, in, a, in a couple days. Um, so today's topic is uh, Carbon Capture Revolution uh, by Professor Arup Sengupta, who is a Rawson professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering here. Um, he's nationally, internationally recognized, has written some books, won a lot of awards, um, and of course teaches here at Lehigh. Um, so the way this is going to work is we're going to hear from uh, Professor Sengupta for 10, 20 minutes, and then uh, it will be the time for you to ask your questions. And you can do that through the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen, probably just um, click that button and you will see the chat come up. I will read the questions um, so that Dr. Sengupta can focus on responding and I'll group things together if a few of you have the same. So, and if you have any questions that we don't get to, um, we'll provide you with um, Arup's email and you can uh, connect with him after the webinar. Okay, let's get going, Dr. Sengupta. Good. Uh, good early afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a wonderful webinar setting where all of you who are there can see me, but I cannot see any of you. So to start with, it is a little bit unfair, but so be it, you know, because I'm still kind of in the driver's seat. Uh, you all, I'm hoping, can read, you know, clearly the, the title of the talk, Mitigating Perils of Climate Change, Unmet Global Needs and Need for an Inclusive Technology. I deliberately accentuated the word inclusive. And during my talk, I'd like to clarify that particular word there. So here I go, you know, but I'll start with an example, you know, which apparently is not related to climate change or carbon dioxide, but this is very much about a major scientific invention, which basically transformed the world for a quite a long period. But later on, it was under scrutiny. And then basically, to a great extent, that invention was also kind of condemned. That's also uh, history of uh, uh, progress of human society uh, on, on many, many fronts. So this example, quick example, is all about a chemical called, you can read that probably at the top, rise and fall of DDT. DDT is a chemical, and this is called dichloro, diphenyl, trichloromethane, fancy name, but we all call it DDT. It was synthesized in 1874, but until 1939, we didn't really know uh, when the Swiss scientist, you know, Paul Muller come in and kind of uh, showed us the insecticidal properties of DDT in controlling diseases like malaria, yellow fever, things like that. The year is also very important, 1939, the beginning of Second World War. In 1945, we can, there was a consensus that global use of DDT in the control of diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. And this is the guy who invented or discovered it. So quite naturally, he was rewarded or awarded Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. I mean, quite an accomplishment, if not the highest one in our kind of world. In 1962, some a lady, came out in Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania. Finally, she wrote a book in 1962 called Silent Spring. And this is the first scientifically oriented environmental activist. And she showed scientifically that DDT over a long period of time through biomagnification had some very serious health-related impacts, including cancer and other things. So you can see then in 19, 2004, in the Stockholm Convention, 
this particular chemicals production was for all practical purposes a band, you know. So this is the journey from height of grace to kind of infamy for DDT. For many other things it has happened. But one thing is important. We, when you came to know about the adverse impact, we acted on it. We didn't sit back and said, let us continue producing more and more DDT. Let me try to jump into the topic of today now. This is carbon dioxide, but this is by far, I still do believe, he, he believe that he is the father of industrial revolution, James Watt. He came up with modern day steam engine and it changed the world. It changed the more than changed the world. All over the world, there are now this uh, plans, railways uh, in uh, Europe, in the United States, China, India, all over the place. And you can see at the top, a gas is always going out and the fuel used used to be coal. Okay, And the gas is, among other things, is carbon dioxide. And this is something James Watt steam engine and it started during that period. And if you take a look at how the topic of today, you know, CO2 level in the atmosphere has changed since then. So here is the carbon dioxide level, 1760, which is kind of somewhere when James Watt was living, 278 ppm in the atmosphere. And now this is 417 ppm. We all know that industrial revolution uh, is uh, the reason kind of behind this uh, rise in carbon dioxide level. So quite naturally, things have come to the fore or come to surface now. And that's basically what we are trying to act on. And, and here, to a great extent, even now, how progress industrially uh, developed a country is that is kind of expressed or can be expressed simply by how much carbon dioxide uh, per capita a country is kind of emitting. Quite naturally, United States, you know, near the top because we are kind of the industrially developed nations. Others are there because population is low. That's why the number is very high. You can see China, Russia, China is coming up. Russia is also quite high. Japan, Germany, and quite naturally, India per capita is still very, very low for understandable reason. This is a barometer or index of how really developed a country is. And quite naturally, now CO2 is also maligned because of its impact on climate change and global warming. What is missing uh, in our database or in our regular uh, news media? This is CO2, which is very high. What is happening is there are tens of countries which are affected by rising seawater level around the world for multiple reasons. I won't get into that. And these are like countries like Bangladesh. You can see their CO2 emission rate is almost negligible. Barbados, which is basically sinking, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Indonesia. One thing is very important now we take it as a global challenge to mitigate you know, uh, the CO2-related uh, climate change. And whatever we are doing, uh, most of these countries, if not all, who have been suffering a lot, they are left out of the equations. That means they are not almost being allowed to play any contributory role to mitigate this crisis. And I sincerely believe this if we consider this climate change to be the third world war, we need a lot of allied forces, a lot of countries. So questioning also is, can we create technology where you can bring in this small, seemingly underdeveloped countries, but the technology will be so simple to deploy that they can also play a kind of allied force uh, role or participant in this uh, climate change war. What is the recommendation? Something called, it's known, IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
they call it the 2050 is the ultimate limit. By that, we must attain net zero. That means if we emit something, carbon dioxide, we also have to take it out. So it's a very simple formula. And the world, at least uh, in words or in paper, uh, want to move in that direction, including the United States. How does one do that? If you look at or the possibility of how we can reduce the CO2 emission and reduce the CO2 level in the atmosphere, it can happen only three ways. Okay. The first one is we are doing it. You replace the fossil fuel with renewable energy, like a, it can be solar, it can be wind, things like that. So that's one. People have been doing that. It is growing. The second one is wherever we are emitting carbon dioxide, we control that. Say this is the plant. This is we call point source or flue gas. Uh, many of you uh, at one time very likely studied at Lehigh, and maybe the Bethlehem steel was in full bloom that time. So they were emitting something like this every day. So it's a matter of going out to, to those exit streams and then capturing the carbon dioxide. That's what it is. That means go and control the so called point sources where the carbon dioxide concentration is very high. But there is another one. This is a very nice uh, kind of photograph, it's ocean and, and the blue sky. But we can also capture carbon dioxide from there. So this is the most current one, most challenging one. It is called direct air capture. That means you can capture CO2 directly from atmosphere. The advantage is that this technology, if it is developed, can be deployed anywhere. It can be uh, in the middle of the ocean. It can be in the mountain of Himalayas. It can be in the middle of desert. So you go there and capture it. One more thing also happening. Because of increased CO2 level, the acidity in the ocean is dropping. Uh, acidity in the ocean is increasing and pH is dropping. And that's how many, many aquatic organisms or lives they're gradually facing extinction. But what is the challenge in direct air capture? The challenge is enormous. That's that if we look at atmosphere, it is primarily nitrogen, 70, approximately 78%. Oxygen, approximately 21%. Carbon dioxide, only 0.0%. It's like a 400 ppm, it's nothing. So capturing CO2 from a background where carbon dioxide is literally insignificant, that is the challenge is. But there is also one kind of bright area. Carbon dioxide is the only acidic gas in the ambient air. That means it's a very weak acid. When dissolved in water, it creates carbonic acid. And we'll look into that. Now, here, <clears throat> question is, how would one deploy? In a very simplistic way, the way direct air capture works is that, and such plants are already existing, not too many, but very few, but that's the way that you use a large fan. This is air from atmosphere. It can be in any location. Then you pass it through what we call filters, and in that filters, you are capturing CO2. And all of them basically utilize the property of CO2 as a weak acid. So you arrest CO2, your filters get saturated, and this is that the CO2 free air is going out. When the adsorbent becomes saturated, you basically heat it to release the CO2, then collect that CO2, and then use it for multiple ways, one of them being geological storage. You can do that carbonation. But let us understand that the magnitude uh, of this issue is in millions of tons. So putting the CO2 in that kind of magnitude is an issue, okay, or will continue to be an issue. That's one challenge. And the bigger challenge is, this is my filter to capture CO2 but I can capture only at 400 ppm concentration, 
which is extremely low. These are technical challenges. International Energy Agency, you know, they have predicted that for direct air capture, if it has to be viable to meet our uh, IPCC target of net zero by 2050, then by 2030, we have to remove 90 million tons of CO2 by that. By 2025, 30. Where do we belong? This is where we belong. That means we are way, way below the target level. And quite naturally, that's an area where there's a room for improvement, the room for productivity. And that's the only thing I'll be talking about during the rest of the lecture, as far as the technology part or science part goes. So what we did in a very simple way, we took some materials which are already commercially available in kind of tons of amounts. And people use that uh, in different places for CO2 capture. So they're there. We kind of took that and they changed the chemistry to some extent using some metals. This is an intermediate product. Then we did another step where we did the improved the acid base properties. The first and the last material, basically same, you know, we didn't really change its so-called physical properties, but this is what we call hybrid ion exchanger or HIX. This is this has the ability to decarbonize. That means capture CO2 from atmosphere. We gave it a name, decarbonix. And this is the sorbent basically we came up with. One can quickly see again, without being technical, how is it different from all others already existing? So this is a data which anybody can interpret. This bottom is the axis for CO2 concentration. And you can see one for 400 ppm, which is very low, like a 0.04%. This is 10%, this is 50%. And this is the carbon dioxide capacity scale. But one thing there which stands out, that 400 ppm may be two orders of magnitude less than 10%. Same for 50%, but the capacities are nearly the same. In other words, this material kind of broke the barrier that at the low concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, it can still capture a huge amount of carbon dioxide. So that kind of made a difference. There are a few others. I'll come down to that without getting into the details. Quite naturally, we have to have some kind of a comparison. There are other materials available or kind of already in use uh, in the field. With 400 ppm, the capacity is nearly five to 10 times lower. Even at 10%, the capacity is lower than we saw at 400 ppm. So that's how its property for CO2 removal is kind of distinctively uh, different. For details, anybody is interested, you know, this uh, research paper available um, in, in the public domain. And if you don't have access, you can write to Lehi, me, you know, we'll be happy to send it. It was published about five, five months ago or six months ago in Science Advances. And quite naturally, it, it uh, for understandable reason, uh, it created somewhat of a buzz, both in the news world and among academicians, you know. And when I talk about the paper, I need to acknowledge uh, Hao Chen, who, uh, did his PhD. Uh, he's now Dr. Hao Chen, and most of the work was done during the three-year period of uh, COVID. You know, uh, this is obviously a significant contribution, and I would like to add: I myself was a graduate student in uh, USA a little over four decades ago, and there is a saying that time, you know, that uh, when Abraham Lincoln liberated the slaves. He forgot about the graduate students. And even now, you know, we kind of whisper that, you know, but I believe we all value the contribution of graduate students. And this graduate student faculty pair is uh, something very significant in the US academic institutions, you know. 
how does one apply this process? Just put the carbonics inside the column, run ambient air through it, air goes out, basically you capture that one. So it is basically as simple as that. In our lab, we created a setup, you can see it. If I level it, you know, this is the decarbonics material here. And this is air fan, this is we are running air, CO2 free air. And then after the capture cycle is over, and I'll get into that, we use hot water, we can use also something else to get the carbon dioxide out from the bed. So it is as simple as that. And by uh, saying that, I mean that I personally don't see any high level of difficulty in deploying this kind of technology in 100 other countries, which are not technologically very advanced, but suffering from climate change effect and can be a part of this so-called crusade, you know. So we take the bait, all we do is we run hot water and you can see tap water at 10 degrees, 80 degrees centigrade, very simple. And this is all CO2 coming out. This is at ambient temperature and nothing happens. Just all you have to get hot water, the column and this thing happens. This is a reaction, one doesn't have to understand, but the fact remains, this is the carbon dioxide in the presence of hot water this reaction is accelerated and this is the carbon dioxide which is coming out. So you bring it in contact with hot water, carbon dioxide comes out, then put it back into operation for capturing CO2 from the atmosphere again. So this is basically as simple as that. There is also more to it because in the previous mode of desorption or regeneration, we collected carbon dioxide. The question is, where does it go? People would say there are underground geological storage. For multiple social, political reasons, it may not be that easy in many parts of the world. So here comes another avenue that we can install this uh, deployment for direct air capture in the middle of the ocean or near the shoreline. And we basically run air, collect carbon dioxide, but this is a material which can also be regenerated with seawater as it is. We have shown that in our paper using Atlantic Ocean water. What happens is then you release water with a high alkalinity, which means it, which is very much like your soda ash, uh, baking soda, uh, which can uh, increase the alkalinity, which means it can reverse the acidification of uh, seawater. But there is a snag there or catch there. We need sodium hydroxide, which can be produced by renewable energy from the seawater or from other means. And if once that is done, so it's a matter of capturing CO2, releasing it into that uh, in the sea, improving the alkalinity, and all of the things, to my knowledge, have already been validated. So this is also another avenue which may be attractive for many other countries. To give you some kind of a perspective about uh, what it really means, you know, uh, there's not too much time left. So this is the Amazon. This is, which is uh, huge, half of mainland USA. And this is our decarbonics uh, uh, inspired uh, CO2 removal system. In one day, Amazon rainforest will capture 1.6 million metric tons of CO2, huge number. Amazon does obviously many other things, Amazon rainforest. But what I can say is this is an engineered piece of equipment. Here, as long as the goal is to remove carbon dioxide in 20 kilometers square, we can capture the same amount of CO2 in one day. So this is what it does. That means if you can uh, install the plant in the middle of the ocean with practically uh, no huge land requirement, there is a way of uh, deploying this technology 
to the benefit without encroaching into kind of other areas or other or, or generating other kind of problems. This is CO2 from atmosphere we're talking about. I know CO2 has been maligned, you know, because of its uh, uh, temperature rise, uh, all this uh, kind of uh, unexpected bad weathers, uh, which is part of climate change. But it should also be looked at from a different kind of perspective. The CO2, what can you do with CO2? We can put it underground. That's a possibility. We can put in the sea water. There it does something. It reverses the acidification of the ocean. There is a possibility carbonation of, we are doing that, carbonation of soft drinks, beer, things like that. There is a possibility of using the CO2 with hydrogen, which is being generated by many people, to produce methanol, which probably would be the next fuel re replacing petroleum in a few decades. And at the same time, we can also produce algae, which can lead to many other products. So this is not exactly kind of something very undesirable suddenly, but there are opportunities and and, and all uh, the crises basically also lead to opportunities for invention and, and innovation. And that's also how we should look at this crisis. So that way, uh, maybe new opportunities will arise from different field. This is, as I said, showed you earlier, this is our DAC uh, goals. And this is where we are, which is we are far below. But the thing is, if we have to cover this shaded part, if we have to improve our performance, we need technologies which are not just limited to uh, application by the United States or a few other handful of countries uh, in Europe. We have to take the technology down to 100 other countries. They can always run it. There is nothing significantly uh, difficult there. And without their inclusion, uh, it may be nearly impossible to address this crisis. So that's why I call it inclusive technology, the technology where we think in advance, which is kind of deployable in many other places for the same benefit because it affects the planet <clears throat> almost uh, uniformly. Uh, lastly, through this invention, you know, we have some, Lehigh has some intellectual property and we kind of got into license agreement, got that one. And I was instrumental in creating a company. And the name of the company is Jivon Climate Solutions. And you can see this is the formula of carbon dioxide, COO. 11 means this is the 11th hour, okay? And Jivon is a Sanskrit word. Uh, uh, it's the oldest language. It means life. Okay, so that's the part. We already have some space in the mountaintop, uh, incubator space, and some people are working. You know, we are very ambitious. Lehigh has been very cooperative. And the goal, obviously, is to create an inclusive technology for rapid global deployment. That's the way we're moving. And one thing, and I'll end up with a uh, short quote, but the fact is, this is a kind of difficult challenge. You know, there are uh, many obstacles, uh, but it is not insurmountable. I have looked at it. I believe it is doable, but this is up to us, you know, that how we kind of increase the number of allied forces uh, in this crusade, you know, and my time is kind of there, and I'll definitely like to welcome questions. So I'll end with a quote, which is very simple. The difference <clears throat> between what we do and what we are capable of doing, which suffice to solve most of the world's problems. And mm -hmm. that concludes my so-called uh, official lecture. I'll be more than happy to entertain questions. And then again, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, if not possible in the time limit, feel free to send your uh, 
uh, comments through email or, or by other means. I'll be more than happy. All right. Yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, so I will start. Um, Stan was asking early on in the presentation about um, why we measure CO2 by um, per capita instead of by country. Is that just the standard or is there a reason for that? No, I guess both of them are there. If you go back, if I can, I go back to my, you know, in my slide deck, mm -hmm. there's also one for uh, the country. Okay. Oh, there is. Okay. There okay. is one for country. So that's also very common. And if I go there, you'll see China is higher than USA. Mm -hmm. But then, then again, you know, after all, we are human beings. The, the number of people should matter. Right. And, and, and that's the part, you know. But yes, those numbers are there. This is another slide there. Okay. But but I replace that with those countries which nobody pays any attention to, but those are the countries who are suffering most. Nobody cares. Barbados or Maldives, they only use that as a clip, you know. But they have to play some roles. That that's the way I look at the problem. Mm. Okay. Uh, Brett asked, um, does carbon capture need to be geographically close to the sort of the carbon emission or can it be anywhere in the world? Yeah, I, I think I tried to kind of uh, clarify this thing. There are three ways to capture carbon. One mm -hmm. of them is point source. So uh, go near a electric power utility, they are burning, say, oil. Mm -hmm. So through their stack, carbon dioxide is coming out, remove that. That You have to go near the source. Whereas direct air capture, we, we can do that in our backyard. We can do that in the Himalaya. We can do the desert. But the mm -hmm. challenge is the carbon dioxide level that is very low. So when you capture, that means you have to treat a lot more air. So uh, you need a very powerful or selective adsorbent. That's the challenge. Uh, so that's that's the why it's a separate category, direct air capture. The good thing is any society, any nation, any country, even island countries can play a beneficiary role because they no, don't need a steel plant or an electric power utility to find that one. Okay. Um, so Daniel asks, um, if CO2 is such a small part of the atmosphere relative to other gases, why is climate change even an issue? Oh, okay, that's, you know, this is, that was not part of my lecture. Other people have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it, but I do not claim any expertise because carbon dioxide can act as a heat trap. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen and oxygen doesn't. So when the uh, visible and ultraviolet energy come from the solar, they get reflected back from the earth, they turn into infrared and CO2 can capture that because mm -hmm. of its molecular property. Oxygen, nitrogen doesn't. Okay. And since it captures, then that causes the warming, you know. So they are beneficial, but if their concentration increases, then it becomes more and more warm. Okay. And then the, another question about that, if it's very successful, is there a risk of removing too much CO2 from the atmosphere? Uh, I won't call, yes. If, if there is no CO2, probably there won't be any life in the planet because the temperature will be so damn low, you know, minus 50 degrees centigrade or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I won't call that a risk because we are monitoring CO2 mm -hmm. every day or every hour. So we are not going to take it below 350 ppm or 320 ppm, you know, we'd be very happy. But yeah. that number is an astronomically high number. Mm. I don't think I'll see that. You know. yeah. um, well, what is the cost per ton of CO2 removed? Okay, so you can very quickly see, you know, whether the question is for me or other people working in the area. The goal is to get to the point of $100 per ton, at least for direct air capture, okay? Yeah. I All I can say is with the due humility, I have done my theoretical work. You can see it is going from laboratory to the field now, okay? But again, you know, we can do some calculation, predict. I believe this is, and here the operating expense is the main expense. OPEX, by OPEX, I mean, you have to run your fan. That means you need energy. You have to desorb, that means you have to put the heat. These are the two. 
what we have seen again and again, if we consider the OPEX, it is possible to get the cost below $100 per ton. Uh, the fixed cost, obviously, it will vary on, on many other factors. So $100 per ton is a possibility. That should be the goal. And right now, the number is much higher for other people who have been doing it, much, much higher. Nice. Okay. Um, people are asking about your solution and whether do you have a patent on that? Um, and also how scalable is it? Uh, first of all, you know, uh, we have a patent through Lehigh University. Okay. A patent application. It takes a long time. Yeah. And then now we we are the licensee. This G-Bond G uh, Climate Solution is the licensee. So that's where it stands, you know, and there are maybe other patents will follow. Uh, and uh, the, the other question was scaling up, you said, right? Right. Okay. This is the part. I believe it can be scaled up. I said a few words about the material because material is, parent material is commercially available, okay? So we can make this material in tons in almost no time. The system design is also very straightforward. We are working on it, you know, and I can see in three months, we can go up to 100 tons per year CO2 removal, which is very significant. And then in one year, maybe 1,000 tons. So, so it is very much scalable because there is nothing really there that we already don't know about once we have got the uh, filter material or the adsorbent material. All other uh, elements, they're already established in science and engineering. Okay. Um, and do you have an estimated time frame required to how much you could scale up this solution? I want to solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and people no, are but, also but asking... that depends, you know, we are proceeding. And it's it takes money, it takes this. There are many people who are interested, many mm -hmm. large companies who are interested. They're talking and talking, but you know, I'm an academic. This talking goes too long sometime. You know, I'm not used to it, but people say that's the normal way. Uh, so that's the part, but I think uh, the money part is important, but we, we are ready to move forward. Also learn, it is, technology is not a magic. You know, we'll learn things mm. and then change, then go. But I have not seen anything so far where mm. it cannot be scaled up or this, the so-called climate change crisis because of carbon dioxide. There are many other factors there. It cannot be resolved if we have the right kind of attitude toward it globally. Mm. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of technical questions on here. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to Pan's question. She says, great talk. I learned a lot. Um, how She wants to know how you got this idea, where your inspiration came from. Was it a random talk with colleagues? Were you hiking? Did it, Was it a dream? <laughs> how did this See, uh, uh, the thought, I, I probably, uh, nobody has praised COVID for any good reason. So this happened in the COVID time, okay? So for almost uh, more than two years, uh, I cannot, I'm not a person who can sit at home and work from home doesn't suit me at all, okay? So I was a regular visitor to my, this particular department or uh, building, and two of my students used to come. And we're probably the only three people <laughs> in such mm -hmm. a huge building. And then I work in a water area. So the, uh, all I can say is that I can give credit to my, I'm a chemical engineer by training. What I have done in creating uh, adsorbents to uh, purify water for people around the world, for arsenic, fluoride, this, that we have done work internationally to provide safe drinking water to the rest of the world. That knowledge was helpful. That's the part. And the, the loneliness or solitude of COVID-19. Mm, okay. So, yes, that is one thing. <laughs> um, a lot of people are asking about the water, um, that once you remove it, is it still potable? Is it still, you know, can you still drink it? Will it affect the marine life? What happens to the salinity of the seawater once you capture it? 
uh, this is there are two ways. One of us we can use hot water. That's different. That's simple. But when I'm using the seawater, again we brought seawater from Atlantic Ocean and we carried out uh, research for many months, and we have studied the quality of water. The quality of water remains very much the same, salinity-wise, or any other property. Only thing which happens is seawater has a lot of chloride. And part of that chloride gets replaced by bicarbonate or alkalinity, or you can say baking soda kind of thing, okay, HCO3 minus. And this is mildly alkaline. That means it neutralizes acidity. So this so-called acidification also is reversed. Many other people are trying the same thing. We have not found any possible adverse impact. But again, this is a subject which has to be studied and has to be approved or, or kind of validated by agencies like maybe EPA or NOAA or some other organizations. We understand that. But I do not see any uh, kind of hold up. Only thing is that we need an alkali, like sodium hydroxide or lime. That's the part, okay? And we have a small grant now from from Department of Energy to pursue that. Oh. Nice. Um, there's a question about the lifetime of the facilities. Will it require a lot of manpower to switch out the materials on a daily basis? No, but the material, yeah, mm -hmm. good point, good point. The material once made, okay, and we are trying that. People ask the resiliency or the durability of the material, okay. Based on my previous experience with uh, ion exchange material, it can last for five to 10 years, you know. That's mm -hmm. what you have seen, you know. So that, I do not consider that to be a huge issue or impediment, but then again, we need to run it to validate. And that's what we are doing, that we are running it many, many cycles to show that it it uh, kind of uh, retains its strength, chemical stability, and other things. But those are the things, you know, which would happen uh, down the stretch or have to happen down the stretch. Right, right. Um... So there's some other very technical questions here um, about, um, let me see here. The, oh, are you using exotic and rare earth minerals as a catalyst and, and why copper? Did you try other things? Yes, we did try many other things. I'll not get into that. And in the paper, I believe it is there because copper or nitrogen, they like each other very much, you know, because this mm -hmm. weak base resins has some nitrogen functional group. So basically, we are taking advantage of this unique copper and nitrogen chemistry. And again, in high school, people have done that in ammonia solution. If you put copper, you'll see a very good turquoise blue color because copper forms complex. And that's why the intermediate product has a blue color. So that's the reason. We used nickel, we used something else, but uh, we knew that it will not work uh, to the same extent. Mm, okay. And the captured CO2, um, is it stable once you capture it? Or is that a problem of, um, I don't know if it would explode or anything like oh, that? No, <laughs> no, not, but it, it just remember, you know, as you are talking, you are Excelling CO2, okay? Right, so right. It, it is not that uh, kind of uh, dangerous chemical. No, it's a very inert chemical in general. In general, it's very inert. But obviously, you can synthesize other things. No, I mean, CO2 is not like hydrogen or even oxygen. It, its ability to be oxidized, reduced, is, is very, very minimal under normal, normal circumstances. Right, right. All right, it is one o'clock. There are a lot of questions here. So those who ask questions that we did not get to, um, rest assured, we will save the chat here and send those questions uh, to Dr. Sangupta. Um, this is really fascinating and um, wish you all the best of luck um, getting this out there. We all need it. Um, and um, thank you everybody for attending. And thank you all for, from my side, you know, I, I didn't see your faces, but still thank you. 
All right. Have a great week, everybody.